Jordan, it's yeah. nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Uh, let me ask you some questions about the faith that you have. Um, you come from a Latter-day Saint movement, not the yeah. mainstream movement. It's not. It's a fundamentalist church. Do you have an, uh, an identity that you use publicly for the... Yeah, Christ Church. Christ Church. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then any like teachers or prophets that you use to identify? Um, currently, the prophet that we have right, right now, we choose to protect his name, so I, I choose not to say it. Okay. Uh, so I was talking to an older gentleman yesterday, mm -hmm. and we were part of a, kind of the same group, and he kind of came in, and I started talking to the older gentleman and kind of split off. Okay. And we were just continuing a little bit of conversation about that. Um, about whether God had always existed. And they, this guy was like, hey, when did God come into existence? And I said, he's, a, he's always been in existence. He never came in existence. Yeah. Uh, what's your view on that? Well, to a sense, I believe that, I believe that the council of gods, which, which would mean Elohim has always existed. But the thing, uh, they have the God, the, pretty much the law of God has always existed. Uh, has always existed, and as gives you the uh, gives everybody the perfect foundation of how you can be, uh, how you can either become a god or how you can get back. So you how you can get back to God and how you can become a god. So it's not something that was created or invented by a particular always, deity. No, it was always it, forever and always existed. So what about God or the gods? Do they? have that same sort of description well to sense you had a father and then you had a then you had a, you had a father and then son and then father and son forever and always in both directions there's no end and there's no beginning an infinite regress is that fair to say a regress meaning you know uh, the ancestry never we are ends. Glad you could join I would say the ancestry never ends okay. mm -hmm. so if I understand correctly Latter-day Saint history there's a couple different views on this and it sounds like your group uh, really privileges the views of Brigham Young, is that fair to say? Um, I would say that we have privileged the views of Brigham Young and Joseph Smith and John Taylor and most of the older uh, older day prophets. We upheld to up, uh, we up, we strive to uphold all the laws of old that Joseph Smith uh, that brought upon the foundation of the world. He restored. Okay, so is, is it your view that at the spirit conception event, um, mm -hmm. between heavenly parents, uh -huh. uh, you had your beginning? Well, I would have to say that technically to a sense, you've always existed because putting down into the basic foundation, uh, the basic building blocks of all, in my belief, in all matter is, well, and everyone was intelligence. Everyone was intelligence before there. Was, everybody was, spi uh, was spirit, uh, pretty much a spirit body. Everybody was intelligent and then they became a spirit body. And then we get to come down to earth to get our physical body. Now, I heard you say everyone was intelligence. That sounds different, this is just for clarity, than saying everyone was an intelligence. Can you see the difference there? So you're saying everyone was intelligence and everyone was an intelligence. I'll tell you what I'm thinking so I, it doesn't sound tricky. Okay. Um, in the, as I understand the Brigham Young view, intelligence is the substance that's eternal. Does that sound okay so far? Is the substance that's eternal, yeah. And at spirit conception between heavenly parents, mm -hmm. uh, from the intelligence begins uh, you, your uh, self, your ego, your person, your identity. Uh, uh, it forms, they formed you who, to you who you are, pretty much. So your beginning uh, was that, that event. Is that fair? Um, the, to so a sense, you could say that, and to a sense, it's like, you or technically sense you always existed, but then... At the same time, you had a beginning. So the technical sense, if I understand correctly, is that the substance from which you were made always I, existed, yes. but that you... Particularly, not, probably, I, I did not exist always. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Spirit conception event, you start to exist. Mm -hmm. So this sounds like a different view from the mainstream LDS. There's, probably. There, yes. there, is, I, I, there, is a lot, there are a lot of Latter-day Saints who take the view that you take. But it sounds like a lot of other Latter-day Saints take the position that intelligences, plural, represent individuals who existed before their spirit conception. Does that sound familiar? I actually don't. I, I, know you don't, I, you haven't, I haven't talked to a lot of LDS people about that, so I, don't, I actually don't know. Okay. Yeah, it, in the mainstream LDS tradition, which I'm not promoting, <laughs> uh, 
Uh, there's a guy named B.H. Roberts, okay. who I understand to be the one responsible for articulating the view that intelligences are people and that at spirit uh, birth or conception, um, they're, those intelligences, which are people, mm -hmm. are enclosed with the spirit body. And so in that view, you, had, you did not have a beginning. And your spirit body had a beginning. It was like an add-on or an upgrade. Okay. And then, uh, then you continue to exist, but you're kind of you're advancing. So, uh, yeah. So it sounds like you're taking the Brigham view. Now, if you're taking the Brigham view, the Brighamite. What's the adjective for Brigham? Brigham. I think you could say Brighamite, but yeah, I guess I think to a sense, I believe in the teachings that Joseph Smith and Brigham taught, and okay. that. And my belief that God taught, that God uh, uh, wants us to uphold. Okay, um, it sounds like if you're taking the Brigham Young approach, mm -hmm. there are probably some other teachings of Brigham Young that you take that Latter Day Saints in general don't take. What probably. Would be, what, what comes to mind? Um, the Adam God Doctrine. And it's interesting. You call it the Adam God Doctrine. Yes, it is a doctrine. Explain that. Well, the Adam God Doctrine is kind of t it gives you more further enlightened knowledge of how, who God is and how do you, how you can become closer to God through the fact of giving you more knowledge of the uh, fact that there's more worlds and the fact that each world has it goes through its own its own process of the the process of salvation which in our, our world we're going through we're going through right now with Jesus Christ he sacrificed his life for us to be able to like he sacrificed his life to re Enable people to kind of advance forward in the Thank in you. the timeline. Yeah. Well, to like let us get uh, um, repented for our sins, pretty much. Sorry, I'm. That's okay. I, I can uh, help along with the articulation. Maybe it. <laughs> it sounds like the Jesus of this earth mm -hmm. has an atonement. Uh, yeah, he atoned. For, so he did the atonement part. I believe that Jesus is the son, uh, was the son for this world. While so, in my belief. Adam, being Michael, that is, I know it's referred in the scriptures. I need to do, I need to be able to know where it's referenced. But what it is is G Michael was actually on his previously was on his own world, and he actually played the Christ for his world and did the atonement for the uh, for his world, and had the whole plan of salvation for his world, and then came to this world now. Now it might confuse some uh, listeners here because okay. in the uh, this sounds like it requires what I've heard multiple mortal probations. Is that no, fair? That no, that is not. Oh, true. really? Okay, I'm so sorry. No, 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 it's no, no problem. Well, it sounds like the Adam for this planet, if I heard you correctly, mm -hmm. played a different role in previous planets okay, or probations. So, in my belief, there is the plan of how to, to how to become a god. Well, yeah, uh, the god of the to how to become a god of the wor of the world now. Technically, this is my. Um, I need to get a, again. I'm, I'm still learning, so please don't be. Uh, no worries. Don't have like, hey, this, this, this. What well, I do, I do like to learn. So if yeah. you have adjustments, please, I, I sure. love them. And so with the plan of uh, to become like a, a god, you have to. For when you have the uh, father and the son, and the son must come down to be able to get it because he has his spirit body and needs to have a physical body. And to be able to be a god, you must have a spirit body and a physical body. So you have to come down to your earth. You have to come down to the earth first, and you have to, well, live uh, mortal probation. Mortal, yes, you have to live through your mortal probation, and you have to uphold all the laws uh, of God, and to be able to get back up, to, uh, be able to get back up to well, you die and you get back up to heaven, and then you can become. If you uphold, uh, uphold, upheld all the laws, you become a god. So after that, after exaltation mm -hmm. to godhood, then you would become, you would play the role you of the an role. Adam for a future world? You'd play world? the Jehovah. Well, in, my, in my belief, you, there is, like the, you have Christ, which in my belief is a role, and you have the uh, Jehovah, which is also the role. The, what role is that? Jehovah is the um, god of the world, is the god of, the, uh, of this earth. The patriarch of the world? Yes. So you could, yeah, you could say that. And so, with going back to the story, if I answered your question, uh, I'm not thinking too clearly. I need to like kind of iron some things out. Um, 
it sounds like people who become gods, they, okay, maybe multiple mortal privations as a term is tripping you up because it, okay, sounds, so, it sounds like you're getting tested multiple times well, in the same way, but yeah. uh, it's not like reincarnation in the traditional sense, but it well, sounds like a person has multiple experiences of mortality in this view. Is that, is that fair? The reason why I'm so, I'm so against multiple mortal probation is because we're um, in Joseph Smith and the test and the teachings of Prophet Joseph Smith, and there's actually a pay uh, an actual session a, se a section where it says that multiple mortal probation is of the devil, and so I okay. I don't don't agree with that. But the, I as defined as like multiple attempts at well, trying something you well, fail. You, like you're living on the same word, world, you're just coming back again and again and oh, again okay. and again. You're not going to die, and then you're going to come back to life as another person to try again because then Interesting. it doesn't, it's not, what would be the point of having to die again and again and again and again? It would be kind of worthless. So if you're successful, though, at mm -hmm. keeping all the laws and you become a god, okay, uh, it sounds like you play the role of well, Jehovah? So I would have to say that you have to be the son, uh, the son. so I believe that, pretty. Uh, I believe that, the son of God, uh, the son of God, which is on our world, and our uh, for our earth is Jesus, and I believe he will have his own world, and everyone that uh, can uphold the law, same laws, because not all of us have done the same things Jesus has done, and I doubt anyone really can. And well, why not? They can, but it's just I don't think they've people, not realistic. It's kind of not realistic to do this atonement all over again, mm -hmm. and I believe that they had. We become gods in embryo, so we will pretty much uh, will be a god's ass assistance, to a sense. Okay. So we will help create. The, I believe that we will help create the next world. Okay. So mm -hmm. uh, you'll be an assistant for a future creation, mm -hmm. but will you ever play the role of a Jehovah for a future? I do not believe so. Um, well, actually, I had an, I at this current model, in order, uh, current time and time and place, I don't have a hundred percent. So I don't know. So our Jehovah was once I would have to see played the role of a Christ. So he was he, our Jehovah, uh, who is the term you use for a father patriarch figure. Yeah. Is, that, is that fair? And then he used to play the role of of Jesus. Well, of Christ. Of, of a Christ, of Christ. Sorry, yeah. yeah. Of a, a role, and then you might become an assistant to a future Jehovah or present Jehovah. Um, I would say, uh, I would say, a, I would say assistant and. I'm not sure about the, uh, okay. the current one, but so, I want to say a, a future. Let me ask you, is there a sense that in the genealogy of the gods, mm -hmm. that there's like a, a privileged line, like a, um, kind of like how on, on earth in ancient times, you had um, a community and then the, the, there's a guy who's king and his son becomes king and his son becomes king and so forth. And it sounds like there's like a, in the genealogy of gods, there might be like a privileged uh, line, a lineage of people who kind of play well, a special would, role that we don't play? I actually don't know the exact answer to that, so okay. I can't really I can't really answer it. Like the Jesus figure, right? Yeah. It sounds like you're not going to play the role of Jesus in a future uh, I don't, mortality. I don't, by my current level of knowledge, I don't, I don't believe so. Okay. So, Adam God, um, you had your beginning at spirit uh, conception by heavenly right. parents. Um, uh, uh, polygamy, uh, what's the attitude? Uh, like, it's a uh, true principle. Uh, can you explain a little bit? Um, it's a well, principle that needs to be up, uh, upheld. And you, I, um, I've read the scriptures. Um, I've read most some of the scriptures. I haven't... Uh, I'm enough not, to formulate enough, the opinion. Enough, enough to form the opinion that I know, uh, I know that... Abraham, he had multiple uh, wives. I know Moses had mul um, multiple wives. I know. So if an evangelical says, like me, so yeah. what? So what? Well, he I'm had concubines too, so that doesn't make it necessarily true. Uh, prescriptive or imitable. Well, I want to say that why would God? Uh, so if Abraham was a God, uh, man of God, why would God allow him to be uh, to go and just be a pledge? Uh, just go and have sex with multiple women. I don't think that would be something that one of uh, one of God's um, prophets, God would uh, would allow. He would have punished him if it was something wrong. But I know that it's 
I think, no. I think maybe the response to that would be God was very patient, especially during that era over that issue with patriarchs that were doing uh, pretty terrible things um, with uh, an ancient worldview that uh, God made allowances for temporarily, kind of structured moral boundaries around it, but planted the seeds which eventually came to fruition in validating slavery, uh, invalidating polygamy, uh, going back to the original Adam and Eve uh, model of marriage. Yeah. Um, so when it comes actually to the Adam and Eve story, I'm not sure if it's... So I like what Brigham Young actually said about it. It is a nice children's story. It gives you a really good, it gives you a really good example of what, what happened. It, it gives you the gist of what happened, but not the full story. And the full story is that Adam himself. The Adam, the Adam God doctrine. So, well, I'm not going to say the full story. I bet there's still some snippets here, but enough to hold the position. If I understand you correctly or understand the Adam God teaching correctly, mm -hmm. when Adam comes to the garden, he has a special kind of body. Is that fair? Well. So when Adam came to the body, actually, so I believe that my, uh, Adam being Michael, when he was in, so he was in the celestial kingdom. He was the God of our world. He made him and his, uh, him and his father made our world and he made our, uh, him and his, well, him and his wife, uh, wives made our world, I should say wives and also the spirit children. And then eventually he, Got to the family was all made, and he went to his father and he said, "Hey, Dad, where? What should I do now? I have the, the world made. I have the spiritual. Uh, I have all of our, our the spiritual spirit children." And his dad will said, "Well, what has been done in other worlds? And also, you need to put somebody on. You need to put somebody to start the world." And Adam, and Michael was uh, thought about that for a second, and he was like, "Well." I have a very, very good children, but the only problem with uh, every, all my children is they don't have any physical bodies. He's like, I do have a physical body, and physical bodies we all we both know we all know that are made in a certain way, and so I, uh, Michael with his wives came down to uh, came down to Eden to Eden, which is actually so they came had to come down to the terrestrial kingdom, which was the Garden of Eden, and yeah. yeah. And they took the fruit of the, uh, the knowledge, uh, fruit of so the good and fruit evil. of the knowledge of good and evil. Did yeah. that, that actually enable their bodies to do something it wouldn't it otherwise do? Them to it let them get down to the celestial kingdom. And with a fit, it brought them to no longer having a, a no longer pretty much having a, ter, a celestial or terrestrial body, and brought them down to a celestial body. This exalted, resurrected celestial body, mm -hmm. and by eating of the forbidden fruit, mm -hmm. they. Uh, are brought into a celestial state such that they can have, uh, did I mispronounce it? Sorry. No, you, 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 you slightly did, but it was fine. I'm sorry. I, oh, I want to know. Uh, telestial, not telestial? Yeah, it's telestial. Thank you. I oh, should know these things. Uh, no, I didn't um, know a lot. I don't know some things that I should know. I'm only 18. Come on. <laughs> All right. Um, so it sounds like the forbidden fruit uh, enables the body to have telestial, sorry, yeah, telestial, yeah. I did it again, um, uh, capabilities, which oh. include having mortal children. Is that, yes. okay. That's how you, well, get mortal children. It pretty much, I would have to say it allow, almost allowed us to be able to sin so that we would have the ability to become greater. Because I believe that it's, even though that we have to go through all the sin, uh, go through sin, it's better, uh, sin will let you, uh, gains you knowledge. You learn you learn, you gain further enlightened knowledge through how going through, through going through experiences through your life. Okay, hold up. Uh, Jesus, how does he fit into this picture? Was, yeah. Well, sorry, I want to know exactly what you mean. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, Jesus never sinned. Yes. In the because, Christian view, and yeah. that means I don't. I agree. He didn't have sin. So how was he able to gain these necessary experiences? Well, he went through the. He probably went through a lot of the same experiences, but he just. We're all given free agency and free will. So I'd say that he just never actually chose to sin. He never actually did the sin. So the sinning wasn't essential, but well, some mortal experience was? The, the fact that he came down to earth was very, very essential. And also having the experience of having a human body was. Okay. 
Oh, having a telestral body, I should say. So at least in our case, sinning was helpful for learning well, and growth and progression. Well, I'd say when you're, when you're a young kid and you touch, the, uh, you touch the stove and you realize that it was hot, you learn from that. Okay. But to, that's like uh, to a little bit of a different thing, but kind of to a sense you sinned, you understand, and you're never going to touch the stove again. Okay, so it's really in the consequence of our sin that we are learning. Is that what you're thinking? Yeah, well, to a sense, because you can also do, you can almost do, I, I would think you could, like, stop yourself from doing a sin, and you didn't do it, and you learn from that. So uh, what other teachings of Brigham Young do you think make your group uh, distinct and, like, uh, different than the Latter-day Saint mainstream movement? Um, Brigham Young, all yeah. the differences. What's, what sticks out from Brigham Young that you would well, you would want to teach to a mainstream Latter Day Saint? Well, I, I, I like I, I personally love the Adam God doctrine, so that one. Um, I know that well, the temple ordinances. I believe the temple has what the uh, church is, uh, people in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. They've changed the the ordinances and which I, ones? Which ones? Um, so it is a ten, the well, temple the second anointings or um, I can't. Oh my god! I interrupted I you. I, no, no, no problem. I can't really talk about this at uh, all okay. because it is sacred. So, can, are you able to talk about how? I know enough to know that in the night. Sorry, the uh, the nineteenth century, the in, at least some of the Latter Day Saint temples. The, the naming conventions after during and after Brigham for Adam, Michael, Jehovah, Elohim, at least in some of the temples, maybe reflected the Adam God framework. Um, and then yeah, in, the, in the endowment, and then in the Latter day Saint movement in the early 20th century sort of reconfigured or settled on a different naming convention. Does that sound familiar? I think so, yeah. They did, um, back in the previous, uh, with the original endowment, it actually highly complements the Adam God doctrine it's they go because it is a true doctrine and if they if you had the original uh, original uh, uh, temple endowment it would make a whole the Adam God doctrine makes so much more sense okay and also with the ordinances some of the way they broke is changing the garment okay yeah. um, blood atonement blood atonement um, yeah we believe it uh, explain define it so blood atonement is blood of uh, is the oath of and you're talking about the oath of vengeance, right? The idea that um, or you know, blood atonement. Oh, ah! a murderer, for example, may not have his sins forgiven, short of blood oh, atonement. Wait, the blood atonement. I don't, I don't know. I don't think we believe in that. Yeah. I need to. I need to do a little bit more. That's okay. Brigham I taught. I remember ex it exactly. Okay. Brigham taught that the blood of Jesus will not cover certain sins. Oh. And yes. that murder requires the spilling of one's own blood. So that they can be forgiven. Does that ring a bell? If not, no worries. I need to go, uh, I need to do a little bit. I need to go read up on that. That's so right. thank you for giving me something to read up on. You're awesome. Well, as an evangelical, I'm glad you don't believe this uh, idea. So as as a born again Christian, the blood of Jesus can cover all sins, uh, including murder and adultery. And so yeah. Anything else that Brigham taught that is uh, interesting? Well, I know that some people are a little. Um, some people don't like the Oath of Vengeance, but the Oath of Vengeance, if you look at it the right way, is different than what they would say it is. This is the Temple Oath to Avenge the Blood the of Joseph Smith? Of the uh, blood of the prophets have been sh uh, shed unjustly, I believe. And it's, it's not, we're not, we ourselves are not meant to go out and try to go hurt or maim anyone that has done it. It's that it's we pretty much pray for, for and we pray that they they will have judge uh, they will have justice placed upon them that God will get uh, that God will do justice for them. Glad to hear at least the second part. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so what is your view, having talked to so many uh, evangelicals or born again Christians on the street? Mm -hmm. uh, you, you've had a couple conversations by now. I have had a quite a bit. Uh, uh, is that from just this pageant? Um, yeah, this is actually my first pageant. Well, technically, first year ever being here. I've come down to... Last week. Yeah, last week. So I've, this is my third day. Cool. Yep. And a bunch of the Christians uh, came up and talked? Mm-hmm. Cool. Pretty eager to talk about gospel stuff? Yeah, it's pretty awesome. Sweet. It's, uh, you guys talk a lot about faith. And <laughs> I, I have to say, 
um, with it. I, I, I like what James said uh, in James chapter 2. It's, it does say a lot of things with um, f uh, faith without works is, de uh, is dead. But I know faith is very important. I know works is very important. Mm -hmm. So I just say that. The topic, I'm not, the topic I'm, of grace. Huh? You're referring to the topic of grace and grace. how we receive it? Yes. So I've had a lot of ca uh, countering of works worthless, and I'm like, work, works aren't worthless. And I have have a lot of support on my own, but then there's a lot of support that they say, saying that God, that it is worthless, and I'm not 100% positive what it, is, uh, what it is, so I do need to go do a lot well, more reading. Let me invite you to do something, but I'm going to give you, like, full permission to mess up because it's not really fair. Would you tell me in your own words your best understanding of the message that the Christians are trying to teach okay. here out in the street? The best? And if you if you get it wrong, it's totally okay. It's it, it, it kind of, it's kind of on us if we haven't been clear enough yet. Hope, uh, hopefully we can clarify. Okay. Well, I would say that um, what the Christians are just trying to talk about, uh, what you guys are trying to talk about is, well, the atonement of Christ, and pretty much that's enough. That to bring it all down, down is the atonement of Christ is enough, and having faith in Him will save you. Mm. And I agree with that, but I also say that works will progress you. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, anything else? I don't any, think so. Any other topics that you've covered with maybe Adam and others? I don't know. I don't yeah. think so. Okay. Uh, has Adam? I think I heard him call, talking about justification yesterday. Did you hear that term? Justification. Justification. Um, being. Um, Man is not, oh yeah, with um, it's in Romans saying that man is not justified by his works, but in James actually, in James two, chapter tw uh, chapter two, and okay, James two, chapters enough for me. Yeah, verse okay no, it's James chapter two, verse twenty two. I believe it says, um, was it twenty two or twenty four? Twenty two or twenty four? It says that. Men are justified by their works, and it's like they're complete. They have completely contradicting. They're like they contradict each other. Mm -hmm. The only difference I saw between them was when the Romans it says, um, the works of the law. Uh, men are not justified by works of law of the law, and in James it says, they are not, uh, they are justified by the by their works, and so and not by faith alone. And it says yeah, and not by faith alone. But, mm -hmm. So. That's something I need to do a little bit uh, uh, more studying on because by my uh, what I came down to believe is that f I know it says in James as well that faith is dead without works, but I don't I'm not sure if it says this, but I would have to say I agree. I kind of developed my own conclusion that works is dead without faith. Mm -hmm. I would say they're both hand in hand. If you don't have works and you don't have if you don't have works, then you don't have true faith. And if you don't have true, uh, you don't have faith, then you don't have true works. Have you heard anyone talk about the Great Exchange yet? The Great Exchange? I don't think so. They might have, but I haven't heard in that um, way of saying. May I explain it? Sure. So it's the idea that when Jesus was on the cross, um, all of my sins were credited or counted or imputed to him. So the idea is that. Um, all my sin. All, all your sins that you've uh, also, will, I think will commit, did commit. Yeah. They're all forgiven for. Uh, they're, 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 it, it's, it's even more than just forgiveness. It's that Jesus is treated like he was guilty of what I did. All the sins that I did. Uh, the guilt and the mm -hmm. punishment and shame and curse that I deserve is transferred. It's redirected away from me to Jesus. And on the cross... Uh, all of Jesus' righteousness is uh, credited to me. So this is, it's a pretty sweet deal, to put it one way, that all of my sin is put on Christ and all of his righteousness is put on me. So here's, here's to kind of reinforce that. Jesus isn't a sinner. Yeah. But he's counted as a sinner. Okay. I'm not righteous. And you're counted as righteous. Yeah, that's what you're. Uh, that's what you're saying, right? Yeah, and it's kind of a. It's. It starts out being a problem, a mystery or paradox, 
uh, because the book of Proverbs says it's wicked to justify an ungodly person. So if, if a judge said to a wicked or guilty person, not guilty, that would be unjust. Well, actually, so I was talking to um, Keith Walker. Walker. Keith yeah. Walker, and he was actually... So I'm kind of support. I, I kind of agree with what he was saying, but like I saw it in a different way, a different way that he was seeing it, with it being in. Oh, what was it? I think it was in Acts, but it was saying that. Um, dang, I just barely heard it. So I. No worries. If you say the phrase, maybe we can look at it. Maybe. Um, it was. Okay, could you remind me what we just said? Okay. We, so wait, you all said. of my sins counted to Christ, and all of oh, His yeah. righteousness counted to me. And even though I'm. Uh, ungodly, he counts me as godly. And even though Christ is godly, he's counted as ungodly. Yeah, I, was, I believe what it was is Acts 3, 38, maybe. Um, I'm, that might have been the, another verse that he was showing me. Um, was that you're, the, unright, uh, the unworthy are justified. Are, he, asked, he asked me who are justified. And it was the unworthy who are justified. And I was like, it kind of makes sense to me because the worthy kind of don't need to be uh well they do need to be justified but it's, it was saying that a worthy don't need to be justified and the unworthy do need to be justified hmm. i was like okay and i was i kind of saw that more of the fact of people who are sinning need the uh, need justice and need a uh, need more repentance and people who are well i'm not going to say no uh, somebody's never sinning because i believe it's hard not to sin hmm. i don't i Amen. Yeah. And so I want to say that they would be just, they wouldn't need ju uh, just, they won't need kind of justification if that makes sense. Maybe this goes in the direction that is helpful here, that maybe that you're thinking. Maybe. I, um, uh, I am in God's courtroom at some point. Uh -huh. And he is a good judge. He's a perfect judge. He's holy. Okay. Um, he's going to judge me. And uh, in some sense, I'm already in his courtroom. And uh, I need a good verdict See, and i'm sure if you ever known somebody who's gone to court that they're like oh man pray for me i, I need the judge to be you know merciful to me or something like that um i need a good outcome i need god to give me a good verdict a good outcome i need him to tell me i'm not guilty and that i'm righteous the problem though is that i'm guilty and i'm not righteous and the problem though is that god's a good judge yep. and, and he can't just wink at sin he can't just look at well god's a just and merciful god yeah, and yeah, considering his justice though by itself for a second, he can't um, he can't just say it's cool. I'll just overlook that. He has to uh, punish sin. He has to satisfy the demands of his own ju uh, just character. Well, so this is why. Go ahead. So I was going to say. So what I know within um, a lot of the New Testament, why Jesus uh, was so kind of annoyed with the uh, priests and the Pharisees was the fact that they were always taking the letter of the law. They never were taking the spirit of the law. And Where do you get that? Spirit of the law and le letter of the law? Well, I know it's a, uh, written a lot. Not written, but I know that Jesus, to a sense, like, there was laws that are given, and Jesus was like, well, he would give more the further enlightened knowledge upon the laws. And it helps you, uh, it helps you understand that the law uh, that with a just and merciful God, which I believe that our God is, he knows when and where to either to bring upon justice and or to bring upon mercy. He knows which one will help you further in life. He knows that if you if you touch if you um would say took the toy from your uh, you took your toy from your sister and you were playing with it because you had it first and would say that. You thought you thought it was yours. So, so okay, you, it's your toy. And your sister's playing with it, and you take it from her. Your little the little kid's going to like, it's mine. Your parents going to say, okay, you can't take that. You're going to be merciful. Well, ah, I'm not sure if I'm explaining this right. Let me let me let me try to help. Um, God, uh, he's merciful, mm -hmm. but he has to extend mercy in a way that also satisfies his justice. I would say that, yeah. And, and it's like I own this fine, in a manner of speaking, and God wants to be merciful to me, but the fine has to be paid. Yep. So there's a debt or a curse or a penalty that. Well, God can help you pay that debt. I'd say. How so? 
How so? Well, either through the fact of giving you more opportunities, would say that you're not having you're not having very good jo- uh, you're not having very good um, business in your work. Like you're not progressing in your work, and God like could help. I guess I'm thinking about a sin debt. Oh, like okay. not a literal debt, but like a spiritual debt, okay. where I, I owe God uh, punishment. I owe Him for all my sins. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would say you need repentance then. Repentance is a change of heart, mm-hmm. at the very least here. Um, uh, I, but my repentance itself doesn't pay my debt. Yeah. So if so, if there's a okay, yeah. If you go to court for stealing, you know, five thousand dollars, yep. being sorry doesn't repay the debt. No, you need to repay. You need to repay the debt. Yeah, and my problem well, as a sinner is I have to pay this debt. My repentance can't pay for the debt. God has to make sure this debt is paid. But he can't wink at it. He well, can't just somebody. Yeah. Oh, I think I see. I, I can see it as so. God can also come and help you pay the debt by like either paying it for you, or helping you increase in your own capabilities of paying the debt. Now, those two options you just gave. Can you talk a little bit more about them? They're, two options. They're, they're pretty radically different. Yeah. Well, the, the one the one was that he pays the debt for us, and the other is that he helps us pay well, the debt. Right. Yeah, I think if we want mercy, although two cents, they're both classified as mercy because I would say I would say it's merciful that I would just help to be able to get work to be able to pay off a debt that I had but at the same time it's you could say it's almost justice because it's like it's just that you had to you have to learn from this debt that you that you caused upon your uh, that you brought upon yourself that you yes you are learning how to be able to do it but now you need to be able to do it Let's say you stole that five thousand mm-hmm. dollars, and the judge is like, "I'm going to be merciful to you. I'm going to give you a loan, and instead of sending you to prison, I'm going to let you pay it back. And I'm not only going to uh, give you a loan. I'm going to give you, you know, like twelve months to pay off the five thousand dollars, and I'll, I will even hook you up with a uh, a government official who can help you find a job. Like that would be very merciful, in my opinion. That'd be awesome. Uh, compare that to the gospel. Like, what, what's the compare and contrast? How is that like the gospel? How is it not like the gospel? So you're saying, how is that not like the gospel and like the gospel? Well, I think God gives us. Tr- oh. I'm not sure if I'm going to get your. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm going to get your question 100% a- 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 accurately. So I'm going to. I want to say that. Well, God. Uh, God would. Through the fact that you. Uh, you need to pay that debt, mm. and. With the judge being uh, merciful, how would that be? Well, I think that's with the uh, atonement of Christ, with the sin that you've made, God, uh, Jesus has paid, uh, technically paid for him, but you still have, in my belief, you still have to work for your, um, you still have, you do work. So let's change change the story a little bit. Maybe that's where I'm going. Um, The the judge has $5,000. Yeah. So he pays your debt, but then he says, you still... You have a loan now for five thousand dollars because you got to pay him back. Mm-hmm. Uh, in some sense, merciful, right? Because he's sort of preventing you from going to prison. He's delaying your. But then it's to a sense like you. Uh, I think you're trying to get. It's kind of judgment, right? Uh, you still owe the full, the, f- yeah, the full fine, the, right? The full thing. Yeah. Okay. Do you think that's in any way like the gospel? I'd say in some parts, in some parts, no. What do you think? Well, I feel like God, uh, with a lot of sin, I believe. Like, so I do uh, say with loss and you do have you made that you don't have to, you are accountable for your sin, but God can, uh, God does help you with your sin, uh, through your sins. But, ah, I'm not sure if I see, I, I'm saying it right. I believe God can help you with all things and with your sins. The only way you can become perfect is through God. And the only, yeah, the only way you can become perfect is through God. Um, Hey guys. Oh, can I show you a Bible verse? Sure. That'd be awesome. Thanks. Let me pull out my big Bible here. Oh, bend down. It is bigger than a quad, but it is not a quad. Oh, okay. It is a, maybe you call it a grandpa Bible. Grandpa Bible. I originally got it. Did you pull it out right here? My hands are kind of tied up. Thanks, yeah. man. No problem. Sorry, I should have helped oh. earlier. Uh, maybe well, I can help you. Do you want me to hold this or Here, that? how about you? We'll do three hands here. Okay. And if you could go all the way to the New Testament... 
and uh, I'll grab the back binding and then go here. There we go. And then all the way to collagens. Collagens, it's that way, right? Yeah. And we'll find it together. I guess the weight of the Old Testament's coming down on my left, on my right hand. Who is <laughs> <laughs> Matthew? And keep going. Mark. We're gonna look for the Pauline epistles. Acts. Acts, Romans. Yeah. The Ephesians. Okay, I think, I think we went too far. So yeah. it's going to be right next to Philippians. Look, I think it's either before or after that. I should know well, this. Well, this is super close to the end. Okay, it's after Philippians. After. Um, this is a nice, actually, Bible. Thanks, man. Uh, it, I originally got it for low light. Uh, okay. Now I just fell in love with it. Cause it's... So we're going to go to chapter 3. Chapter 3. And we are going to look for... Um, a passage that I'm gonna scratch my. It's almost dead. Nope, it's not dead. Okay, you just keep on looking at it. Okay. So, you know. so I was wrong. It's probably in chapter two. Um, aha, here it is. So in verse. Hmm. Okay, here we go. In verse thirteen, chapter two, verse thirteen. I was wrong. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. So just for reading comprehension here, Verse uh, verse fourteen. What? Uh, or verse thirteen. What was forgiven? Well, he said all your sins, all your trans trans trespasses. Trespasses. Good. Yeah. When you can't say a word and you know how to say yeah, yeah. it, it's like <laughs> it's, it was approximated sufficiently. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what were we dead in? Verse three. Thirteen. Thirteen. What were we dead? Uh, what were, were we dead in? You said we're dead in your tre trespasses. And we were made what? God made. Oh. Uh, did you God made, made alive. He You're made alive. us alive. We were dead in our trespasses. He made us alive. Ah, this and, is. So I'm, I'm thinking of that. Um, and uh, Matthew with the with the, the Lord with his two sons. How his son went out and he came back. He said, "My son was dead and he came back alive because mm. he repented. He was dead, mm. and that old him of all those uh, all of his sins had died off. Uh, had died off, and he became uh, alive again." So part of here in verse 14, part of what comes up with being made alive is him having forgiven us all of our trespasses. Mm -hmm. Verse 14, uh, what was canceled? By canceling the record. By canceling the record. The record uh, of debt. Yep. That stood against us. And how did he cancel this record of, of debt? Well. How did he set it aside? By nailing it on the cross. I believe that. Wait, sorry. Yeah. yeah. This he set aside, aside nailing, nailing it to, it to the, cross. the cross. So he took my debt and he canceled it, but he did it by nailing it on the cross. It's and almost like was... paid in full. Yep. Check written, signed, stamped, mm -hmm. received. The bank is like, cool. Paid. Yep, paid for, all good. So yep. it it from this passage, Christians believe that our sins, we were dead in them. And we were, we were spiritually dead. We were legally dead, guilty. Uh -huh. But uh, he forgave us. And he forgave us by taking our debts and completely canceling them by having them paid for by Jesus on the cross. So all of our debts paid for. Mosquitoes are starting to come out. I noticed. <laughs> I, the first actually night I was out here, they were attacking me. And then the last night, they don't like me now. I think I'm, it was because I was eating some. You want to hold that for me for a second? Yeah. I got. I need my right hand here to trim away. There. So uh, the great exchange, mm -hmm. the idea is that uh, I'm not righteous, but Christ counts me as righteous. And Christ is not a sinner, but he is counted as a sinner. And that is a, an exchange because sin is going from me to Christ mm -hmm. legally. And his righteousness is going from Christ to me. And that, yeah, I heard that. I heard that. I'm. Do you know where that's written again? If we could look at it, one, uh, yeah, yeah, it's second. It's, it's, right, it's right here. It's right. No, it's a uh, second. 
Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Oops, sorry. 2 Corinthians, oh man, I, 521? 2 Corinthians 521, sorry. Google is spoiling me. Uh, I think it's 2 Corinthians 5.21. Aha! Here it is. Uh, For our sake, he made him, Jesus, to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And the contrast here is that Jesus, who knew no sin, he was made to be sin. And in the same way... Wait, well, how... Huh, okay. Yeah, please think out loud. No, no, no. It's, it's, um, I, I just answered my own question in my mind. What was the question? Um, It was a question that was kind of just... It was question stupid, so I was like, oh, wait, never mind. I, I like stupid questions. Because it, it's, it's just processing. It helps people think. Well, I don't know. I was just... One in my head, I was like, so if he, if he became... I don't see how he became sin. I see it more as, like... I don't know. How I was seeing it was... Um, I think I do know what I thought. It, I'm just not 100% sure if it's positive. Um, I know that he came into sin because I believe that Jesus came on down to this world to experience this world, which, and then he d- did the atonement, so... He never sinned. We both agree there. Yeah, he never sinned. But then with this saying, he did sin. And then not I, that he did sin, but that he He was, became sin. Yes. And so yeah. I, I see that, and I'm like, wait, how... How can you become sin? And the other question would be here in verse, the latter part of the verse, how can we become the righteousness of God? Well, you can, how you can become the righteousness of God is if you obey God's commandments. Uh, well, at least according to this passage, uh-huh. it seems reasonable to think that the same way that Christ became sin is the same way that we become the righteousness of God. Yeah, through the atonement. Through the atonement, mm-hmm. and Jesus didn't become sin by doing sins. Yeah, he became sins by taking them upon, uh, upon himself. Yeah, and we, in this verse, mm-hmm. don't become the righteousness of God by doing righteous things. I still think that you have to do righteous things because what would... I like the uh, James, like, like I said earlier, James, James chapter 2, verse 22, or 24, it says... Um, through, uh, through, um, it, maybe through this will help. It, it seems impossible for someone to truly know God and be saved. If they only do it from themselves? If they, if they never have a change of heart, a life. Yes, I obedience. agree. I agree. You have to be full. I would have to say you have to have full faith. and tr- You would have to have full faith in God. If your brother said, hey, uh, sorry I'm late. I got hit by a bus. I'd be like, what the? Are and you okay, like, man? I wouldn't care about you. <laughs> yeah. being and then late. he was like, no, I'm cool. I would like, still be like, you, t- you didn't get hit by a bus. You were like totally fine. Or like, I'm sorry. I well, got- he got tapped by a bus. But yeah, still, yeah. as he first said it, I'd be like, well, why did you just say that? Or if a guy says, sorry, I'm late. I got hit by a truck. And he's like, I'm totally cool, though. I'm fine. You'd be a little suspicious, maybe. Like, let's say his car was completely untouched. His body's completely untouched. If somebody says, I encountered the living God, and... I have, come from the living God? I encountered, I... I uh, got to know God personally, and He changed my heart, and He forgave my s- sins, and I was a part of the great exchange. But nothing's different. Then I'm not sure how anything, how something would, how it would be nothing is different. You'd have to have something. I, that's I agree. Different. We would expect some sort of different change, right? Uh huh. But before we consider that, mm-hmm. in the verse we just read, it does seem reasonable. It does seem to be the point mm-hmm. that we become the righteousness of God the same way Jesus becomes sin. And and Jesus didn't become sin by sinning. And I don't become righteous, in this sense, Mm -hmm. by doing righteous things. There's a different way I become the righteousness of God. And it's the great exchange. It's all the sin... Through grace, you're saying, yeah. You're saying, right? In particular, all the sin that's the junk and the curse and penalty that I deserve is transferred to Jesus' bank account. And all the righteousness of Christ, which I haven't earned, 
is credited to my bank account. There's this beautiful exchange where all my debt becomes his debt and all his righteousness becomes my righteousness. And because it's legal, it's instant. So you're saying because it's legal, it's instant. So it, yeah. there was no like... Okay, I think I understand what you're saying. If a judge decides to forgive a criminal, he can, he can hit the gavel and he can um, write up a document, sign it, and it's done. It's effected, right? So it's a legal, uh, uh, if, if, you're, if you're the president of the United States uh -huh. and there's a dude in prison uh, for life, okay. you can sign a piece of paper and you can give him a pardon, right? And the pardon is instant. He goes from being held accountable for his capital crime, perhaps, to being... Invalid, no longer being there. Completely pardoned. Mm -hmm. So it's completely legal and instantaneous. And that is sort of where Christians, that is where Christians are going with the great exchange. That because it's instant, it can't be something that I accomplish by works or a gradual change of life. Yeah, that, I, I do agree that faith saves you, but I do, I, I don't have all, I don't have 100% scriptural referenced, but how I've, how I've read the scriptures and how I've come to understand them, well, faith, you are saved by um, works you progress. Will you pause for just 20 seconds? Yeah, don't mind. Sorry. Hey, hey Rachel. Kathy. These guys right here look like they're great. Yeah. What are these guys? Youth group. Oh, cool. And they're just kind of walking around for fun. And, uh, hey, Rachel. These guys with gray shirts. Oh, you already tried? No, I have not. Oh. So we're back. <laughs> okay, we're back. <laughs> I saw a group of t uh, youth that I wanted to suggest some Christians go talk to. So, yeah. So when Christians say we're justified, mm -hmm. what we're referring to is the Great Exchange. Yep. The legal, instant declaration that I'm righteous mm -hmm. and that Christ is guilty of my sin. Okay. Instant. Uh, appropriated by, received by faith. And the faith is very weak. It's very not impressive. And I have not really spent a life. I've not spent a life yet at this point, proving myself qualified or worthy. This thing is heavy, by the yeah, way. Yeah, you want to put it down? <laughs> it's a, it's oh, a, oh, I was like, did you do some curls? Yeah, no, yeah. I just started yeah. working out. All right, let's start doing some uh, uh, push presses. And um, yeah, so that's the great exchange. And that's what Christians believe is the starting point and the forever foundation of the Christian life. Okay. So if somebody said, I'm a, I'm a Christian and I'm trying to be a better person, we would want to make sure the Christian understands and believes that they are justified. Well, I think it's always better. I think it's like to become a better person, I think that is great. I, I, I strive to become better each day. Maybe it be just with one small thing here and there. But because I, I do believe in progression, though. I believe in progression after death that you will constantly pro, pro, uh, progress and you'll never cease to progress. So you're in the courtroom and you're guilty of stealing the $5,000. Yep. And uh, the judge says, um, what, what do you say for yourself? And you say, well, I'm, I'm becoming a better person. I would say that I am striving to pay the debt and I apologize that I am not, uh, has not been paid off yet. So role play, the judge says, you being better doesn't pay the debt. Yeah, and I would, I, I would know that. So you got to go to jail. You, you working to partly pay it off. You, like that's, you still need to pay a full penalty for being the kind of person who steals five thousand dollars. Being a better mm -hmm. person, so you go to prison. Yep. And you, and you improve your moral character. And you write a letter to the judge and you say, I'm a better person now. I've progressed in my morality. Well, I, I doubt that the judge would, uh, would, for one, he would not give a crap. And you would just have to probably send your life, sit in that prison, and then after you get out, then you could probably become better. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, with, no, I. With God, we owe this great sin debt. Yep, and God just and repays if, it. If we say, we're doing better, we're becoming better, that's not what helps us have the debt paid. Mm -hmm. How do we get God to pay our debt? 
how do you get God to pay your debt? Um, I would say that you have to have faith and you have to, well, give credit and glory on to all, give credit and glory all unto God. Can I show you one more passage? Sure. Just trying to help you, your arms here get more muscular. Oh, um, oh thank you. I'm not sure where you want to be. I'm kidding. Uh, so Romans, chapter. Hello. Hello. Uh, oh, sorry. Romans chapter. Looking at the super large print Bible. You could read it from all the way over there, probably. Wow. Yeah. This page is going to bend. Oh no! Thank you. So Romans chapter four, verse four. You might have already heard this. Four verse four. Now, to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So a little bit of the reading comprehension. Uh, if a man works, what are his wages not counted as? Saying that they're not counted as gifts, uh, as gifts, but rather just debts, not debts. Um, due. Yeah. Due. Yeah. Debts so, due. Yeah. Uh, in your understanding, what does that conceptually mean? And what's the meaning of that? If you're a pizza delivery guy, and you work full two weeks, and you get your paycheck, the, the paycheck is not a. In this passage. Yeah, the paycheck is not an uh, actual paycheck. It's not actually gaining you anything. Well, uh, it says, when a man works, to the one who works, his wages, so stop there, if you're a pizza delivery guy and you mm -hmm. work two weeks, your paycheck or your wages, they're not counted as a... Do or, or a gift. A gift, right. Mm -hmm. They're rather, they're instead counted as... Uh, yeah, they're, they're worthless almost. No. Oh. But you're saying, saying if you do, your paycheck is worthless. Uh, your paycheck gets worthless. And... Hi. Hey, Tony. I just had to get him on. Your paycheck... Sorry, sorry about that. Um, your paycheck is not counted as a... Your wages are not a... Your wages are not a due. Wait, well, sorry. His wages are not counted as a gift. They're not as a gift. Sorry, I don't... It's okay. I kept on thinking you were saying the other way around. Oh. <laughs> it's not a trick, I promise. So, no, sorry, my mind got focused on Tony for a second. Sorry about that. Um, no, no, I no, can see why that was uh, no. uh, distracting. So, uh, opposite, you get a Christmas gift um, mm -hmm. in the morning. It's not your wages. It's you actually a, got a gift for that. It's a gift. If you get a uh, paycheck for being a pizza delivery guy, it's not counted as a... Gift, it's counted as a due. As a due. Okay, yeah. it's a debt. Uh, it's rightly earned. Uh, it's something owed to you. Uh, your wages are not counted as a gift. I think Sorry, we're good. I'm just trying to get out of the way more often. That's right. they Thank you. Thank you. So that's the first half. Mm -hmm. We made our way. We made our way. Second half. And to the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. So... Um, who is counted, uh, who is justified? The, unright, uh, the ungodly. The ungodly. Mm -hmm. um, what does he not do in this verse? What does he not do? He doesn't do the works, you're saying. So he doesn't work, but he doesn't instead do work. he does He doesn't what? do works, he does work. Well, to ones who does not uh, work, but believes in, he just, he believes. He what? believes in Christ. He believes in God. Uh, I apologize for... Um, being particular. No, no, it's perfectly fine. What God is he trusting, according to this verse? Which God is he trusting? Well, I would add... Sorry. What What kind of God is he trusting? I would say a uh, just God. Uh, according to the verse, what does this what God do? And to the one who believe in him, who justifies the ungodly, his faith is God. Right, right. Well, a righteous God? Because it doesn't... Um, according to the passage. Yeah, I know. He's We're... trusting God... But this is a particular kind of God. This is the God who what? Gives mercy. And, and glory. According to the verse. <laughs> not trying to be difficult. I know. I, 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 yeah, I yeah. swear I'm like not understanding, it's okay. but it's like pre uh, pretty obvious. To, and to the one who does not work, but believe in him, who justifies ungodly. So he, he believes in him who? Him who what? He believes in 
who believes in God. Who does what, according to the verse? Oh, we do. Uh, we believe in God. No, no, no. I'm, uh, you said who does According to verse 5, this one who's not working is instead trusting God. Mm-hmm. And if somebody says, who? The God who does what? And verse 5 answers that. It's counted as righteous. But in him who justifies, it's the God who justifies the ungodly. Yeah. Okay, that's where you yeah, I was yeah. seeing. It's okay. I, I, uh, it's I was, okay. When I said just, a just God, I was... That's I okay. was thinking of just, uh, the he's, just. He's a ungodly. just God who justifies. That's, yeah, that's that's, that's how I, I saw that in my head. So I was like, I thought that's what you were looking for. That's all right. Yeah, yeah. So so um, he's not working for wages. Mm-hmm. If he was working for wages, they would not be counted as a gift. They'd be counted as his due. Well, I think I... Instead, he's not working... He's not working, but he's, he's, he's trusting, believing. Yep, he's believing in God. in Him who yep. justifies the ungodly. So the, the ingredients there, the recipe, the the connecting the dots. Mm-hmm. I'm ungodly, and if I work for God to justify me, it won't happen. Because when you work, you get wages which are owed to you. But what I need isn't wages. I need something counted as a gift. Yep. So the, the gift that God gives is only given to a person who stops working for it. They instead trust God to justify the ungodly, namely me. So I say, Lord, I trust you to justify me. Well, I... And I'm ungodly, and I'm trusting God to justify me Mm-hmm. as godly right now mm-hmm. as perfectly righteous right now even though I'm not that is touching on the great exchange but the perfect perfect and complete righteousness of Christ is credited to me and my sin is credited to Christ but only if I stop working for it and start trusting God to justify me the mm-hmm. ungodly. So, what do you think? What are your final thoughts? I think uh, my f- final final thoughts on it is the fact that how I read th- when we were reading this, I was like, well, I believe this person is trying to be uh, against. I believe the people who are he's talking to is saying now to the ones who works. I feel like he's saying that the one who only works, who doesn't have any faith, all you're doing is works. You don't have actual faith that your works will do anything or your works will grant you. Well, but according to the passage, that's wh- how I uh, that's how I understood it. But that might just be yeah. how I was how I've been okay. understanding most scriptures. But yeah, in the passage itself, this person who's who has faith, who's mm-hmm. trusting, is in particular trusting God to justify the ungodly. Now yep. contrast that with somebody who is saying, I'm trusting God to justify the godly. And so I need his help to make me good enough. And then when I'm good enough, he'll justify me. That is what Christians are saying is a false gospel. We're saying that the true gospel, it's kind of like declaring bankruptcy. God will only fill your cup. He'll only forgive you. Mm -hmm. justify you, give you the benefits of the great exchange if you declare bankruptcy. Oh, so you're saying that God's only going to help you when you pour out your, all your heart, mind, and strength, all your, pretty much you pour everything you have onto him. When you stop working for it and you start trusting God who justifies the ungodly. Yeah, I can, I can see that, but I still see the fact that uh, works are still very important, I'd have to say. I say that they are a byproduct of, of faith, that nobody can tell me that works are something that, oh, I can put that Yeah, sorry, to relieve your... I was kind of like trying to bend that back. Oh, no, it's good, it's good, my, thank you. Yeah. It's been abused, yeah. <laughs> but, um, so, I can, I've seen, I see it more as... Through the works, 
you will, uh, that you will do, they can, through uh, the works that you do, showing that your, your, through works, your faith becomes perfected. That is James 2, 17. Hmm. Or, it's James 2, 17, I think. It's in James hmm. 2. What do you think perfected there means? Um, having perfect faith. Okay. Mm-hmm. Can we end with a Jesus story? I know Jesus, story. Sure. Are you feeling like a time to transition to something else maybe? Yeah. Okay. Well, let's do a Jesus story and then we'll, we'll call it. Sure. That'd be awesome. Okay. Um, Luke 7. Luke 7. Jesus is having dinner. Okay. Um, and a woman comes in, and if I remember the details correctly, wipes Jesus' feet with her hair. Mm-hmm. Shows adoration for Jesus. Uncomfortably so. And there's, a, there's an objection. Um, you know, this th- this is... Uh, this woman should have sold the perfume that she's using, maybe. I, I think that I'm mixing up two different stories, the details on... Well, the, the perfume... Uh, per, uh, sell the perfume perfume for money or something like that? Yeah, I think it, the story is either that story or similar to that story, but there's an objection that this woman is shouldn't be doing this. Or, or No, I, I know what it is. I'm sorry. I should know this. No, no problem. We're all human. Jesus, do you know what kind of woman this is? I think that's the thought that they had, and I'm mixing up with a different story from John. I'm just going straight. I'm not really paying attention. So, um, Jesus looks at Peter and says, Peter, I have a story for you. There were two men who owed a, uh, a debt. One owed 500 denarii, and the other owed uh, 50 denarii. And the master who they were indebted to uh, canceled their debts and forgave them. And Jesus says, Peter, which of them do you think will love the master more? And what do you think Peter's response was? I would think the, the one with the 500. Yeah. And Jesus goes on to explain this woman who came in, kissed my feet, loved me. Um, her sins are many. But she loved much. She's, um, I forget the exact language. She's forgiven much. She's loved much. He ends up summarizing the story by saying, he who is forgiven little loves little. So here's the principle. Um, The one who was forgiven, that was 500 denarii, uh, had a greater appreciation than the one who was forgiven for 50 denarii. And therefore, the one forgiven for the greater debt had a greater reward, motivation uh, for love, a, a kind of a deeper heart, like a deeper whoa, you know, a deeper like, oh, wow, thank you. Deeper, glo- uh, deeper gratification. Yeah, a deeper thanksgiving. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so if the, here's the Christian principle of love and obedience and holiness. If you want to love God and you want to love your neighbor and you want to be obedient and holy, then the first thing you need is you need to have all your sins forgiven. You will be more appreciative and thankful to God in your love and obedience if and only if your sins are forgiven. So the irony is for a person whose sins are completely forgiven, they're more empowered to love their enemies, love God, love their neighbor, than someone who hasn't had their sins forgiven. He who is forgiven little, Jesus says, loves little. Who is forgiven little, loves little. Yeah, I can see that. So wrapping it all together, faith Mm -hmm. without works is dead, right? Very clear. Yeah. Uh, Somebody who says they have faith but don't have works, they're a hypocrite, they're lying. Yeah. Uh, They're fakes. Yeah. But somebody who has truly had all their sins forgiven has a deep... (laughs) Uh, relationship with God such that now they can love deeply God and people and that's what happened to me in high school when I was 17 years old God forgave all my sins and the people that I considered enemies that I did not love that were difficult to me um, the logic was God forgave me when I was difficult why can't I forgive them yeah yeah and so the way faith without works is dead plays out in the Christian life is having all your sins forgiven completely 
And then you have fates, which again gives you work. Uh, sorry, that's what produces. Yeah, produces an obedience work. later. Yeah, that comes from having been freely forgiven. So the question you've got to ask yourself is: Is that the gospel that your movement has? Does it teach the great exchange? Does it teach that you can be justified or counted righteous by faith, not by working for it, but by trusting God who justifies the ungodly? And if you have you experienced the rebirth, the, the special experience of having all your sins forgiven, of knowing that Christ has nailed your full debt to the cross, such that now he holds nothing against you and never will, and now you're empowered to love people, completely justified, counted righteous, forgiven, not guilty, and now you can have a relationship with God and with people with a freedom. I'm forgiven. I'm counted right in God's eyes. I'm counted perfect in God's eyes. So now I can go and love people that hate me or that I've hated them in the past mm -hmm. because God lo loved me so much and accepted me freely. God, as the perfect adoptive father, took me in, gave me a big hug, forgave all my sins, told me to take off my dirty socks, put them in the wash. He set me at the best seat in the table. He set me down, put a plate in front of me, and he said, have a meal, the full meal. And I said, I didn't earn it yet. He's like, you don't you didn't earn any of this. I just let you inside my house and I adopted you as a free gift and I loved you and I forgave you. And now you're mine and I'm yours. And now you're in a safe place. And now you can be my servant, my son, but not because you're earning it like an employee, not because you have to prove yourself worthy or qualified, good enough. But you trust me to t take you in? And justify the ungodly. Yeah. Thank you for talking with me. Thank you for talking with me. Yeah. yeah. It was Eric, right? Aaron and... Aaron. Jordan. Jordan. Aaron and Jordan. Yep, Aaron and Jordan. Enjoyed it. Hope you did too. I did. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Gave me a lot to actually think about. Cool. Yep.